word for word uh, e either. So that's kind of the way it's going to go. Four classes, and they'll be, they'll be recorded. So if you miss one, you can, you can get it back off our, the Grace Community Church Podbean podcast thing. You can, uh, we'll maybe put that on the screen um, at the end, too, or something. But my phone number is 728-2916. If you want to text me and ask for the notes later, well, you see how good it is first, and then, then decide whether you want it. And, uh, and then my email address for sending your $20 fee. Just kidding. Um, it's just merle.nisley at gmail.com. So... Uh, or you can ask you can ask for the notes that way as well. All right. This is not a sermon. It's not a Bible study. Um, this is a uh, this is a class that I felt motivated to do um, because there are things that that sort of prompt me to do it, and I'll talk more about that. So uh, I am going to pray, even though it's not sermon. I, I take it pretty seriously to, uh, to talk about how we use the Bible. I take it pretty seriously that, uh, that I have uh, an influence on you and on younger people uh, about how we use the Bible. And I'm, I'm cautious about that. But caution is not the same as fear. And uh, there are some things that I feel we need to review that our culture, our time, needs to review. Ask some questions about, and that's what I want to do. So we're going to pray as we start here. Heavenly Father, first of all, I want to really thank you for revealing yourself to people. That you didn't just leave people alone without any kind of uh, knowledge of you and without a way to connect with you and get to know you. I thank you so much for how you um, took the initiative, mainly through Jesus Christ, to reveal who you are and to accomplish uh, all that we need for life and godliness. So tonight as we talk about how we use the scriptures we have, I pray that you will keep me from saying things that I shouldn't, keep us from hearing and understanding things that, that we shouldn't. I pray that you uh, guide us toward truth and toward a uh, heart that is open to you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So find a seat. I told the other people that we're going to do group work, so kind of get yourself prepared for that, that you quickly swivel your head like an owl and talk to the person behind you or in front of you, however, however the need may be. <laughs> scripture is, uh, uh, written scriptures are, are uh, varying importance to different religions. Some, some religious groups use scriptures much more than others. And the Jewish tradition was the first tradition to really make serious use of Scripture. But even the Jewish tradition didn't use Scripture for a long time, a long time, and eventually did. So the Jewish appreciation for and use of Scripture written written um, the the use of scripture has become very important and uh, we Christians Christians who and the church in general has placed a high value on having the scriptures in one way or another ever since the church began and as you may know already, that changed a lot from day one. Like from the day of Pentecost, for example, 
uh, what they had for scripture uh, is very different than what it was 500 years later, and what it was a thousand years later, and even up until the 1800s, uh, things still kept changing. So we're now so used to having uh, a Bible available in Scripture that we, we don't really think about how recent that phenomenon is. We don't really think about how differently we might use uh, or view the Bible than Christians have for almost all of history, uh, viewed it very differently than we do now. So that motivates me to, to teach uh, on this subject or to study it and learn and then share it. The other thing that's happened all through the history of Christianity and the Bible is that during times in history, whatever people were studying and believing and learning from philosophers at that time made a huge difference as to how people read the Bible and understood it during that time. And then during those times, people would write stuff or new doctrines would come into the church and might continue on, they might not. And then we look back at certain times and we say, oh, that doctrine must have, or we look at a doctrine that something that's taught now or understanding ways of reading the Bible now and we say, oh, it must have been like that for, for all time. And a lot of it is actually fairly recent. And a lot of it, a lot of what we, a lot of what we consider normal understanding wasn't really so when the church started and has changed. Now, that may be good, may be not so good, but we need to know some things like that. We need to understand uh, where some of those things come from. How it, and, and along with that, what happens in a time like now, let's take, let's take the 20, what do we call this, the 21st century. Let's take the 21st century and how that is affecting the way you and I think about the use of the Bible and how we understand it. And we sort of tend to think, oh, I just read it. I, I just read it and, and uh, I'm not affected by uh, the philosophies of now. I just read it the way a person should. All of us do, don't we? I, I read it exactly the way I should, you read it exactly the way you should, and everything's cool. In fact, that's exactly the philosophy that is, that is maybe influences us the most in our time. And uh, uh, so, so right now, I think we have uh, a wide range of understandings, and, and that's a lot of what motivates what I want to talk about. On one hand, of, on one side of that spectrum, we have uh, some very fundamental statements about the Bible that are uh, that that are are sometimes extreme sometimes very, very uh, forceful about the authority of the Bible and its sources, how it came to be. And in fact, some of those statements uh, by some fundamentalists are so strong, they're not even true. They're not even verifiable by fact and history. So we have that on one extreme, and that's part of the Christian experience right now. And on the other hand, where more of us probably are, is that we are influenced to think uh, individually. And the, the, one of the highest values of our view of spirituality in our culture right now seems to be that you should take the Bible and read it. And whatever it says to you, that's exactly what God means to say to you. And 
don't mess with me on that, and don't try to tell me what the Bible says to you, because it's none of your business what the Bible says to me, and it's none of my business what the Bible says to you. And we are more and more um, being conditioned to believe that the Bible can is something you just hand to someone and you say, whatever, whatever God says to you, go with it. And then we have everything in between. We have everything, all the range in between those two sort of extremes of, of things and uh, that's the kind of stuff I'd like to talk about. Let me tell you, first of all, that I don't have the final word on how we find our way through all of that stuff. I don't have the, I'm not the authority on how you should view the Bible. I don't plan to answer all your questions. But I do believe I can help you think through some stuff and ask some questions that might sometimes make you uncomfortable and might sometimes make us wonder, what's this guy suggesting here? I want to assure you that I, I... Well, I'm comfortable with my approach. <laughs> so you should be too. No, that's not true. You should critique and ask questions. I want to invite you to ask and discuss anything. Um, I won't, we probably won't have a, 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 an intense debate here. Um, we'll probably defer that to another coffee time or something. But you can ask and say anything in response or in uh, challenge to what I say, and, uh, and, and I'll welcome that. There are, um, there's a reason why I have a picture of a Grand Canyon with the opening slide. And I'm gonna come back to that, uh, to the Grand Canyon as a helpful illustration in a couple different ways. But right now, the Grand Canyon illustrates um, to me something that, that is part of my worldview about the scriptures. And that is that it is one of the most uh, sophisticated and, and amazing it is the most sophisticated and amazing piece of literature available to humans today. It really is a, an amazing thing. It is something that you can see part of and really appreciate. But it is also something that you will never finish exploring. And I think the Grand Canyon helps illustrate that. The Grand Canyon is a, is a beautiful place and it's a dangerous place. It's a place where people can hurt themselves very easily by being careless. And it, but it's a place of unbelievable beauty and amazing scenery as well. I've been there a couple times, but I've only seen a very little bit of it. So that's one of the reasons why that's a, an illustration there. This is a, uh, a quick overview of at least three points, three subjects essential that we're gonna work at in these four classes. One of the first one, and let me, let me tell you this. I believe that these three things can make 
the greatest difference in how you read the Bible. Because you believe something about all three of these things. You already believe something about all three of these. And I'm going to tug and pull at what we think we know about these. And I hope that we learn some things about that. First of all, every Christian that I know, that I've ever met, believes that the Bible is inspired by God. However, about as many people as there are in here are about that many different ways of describing that. And our point in this class is not going to be to all describe it exactly the same. But the point is going to be to review why we think what we do about inspiration. And is my understanding of it, my view of it, Actually defensible? Is it logical? Does it, does it fit with history and with the Bible itself? Um, so we're going to spend some significant time on that. The second thing is, um, I'm not going to go into this greatly, but everybody has in their mind, every one of us has in our mind the grand story that, that the Bible tells us. And we tell ourselves that story every time we hear a scripture or we filter everything through that grand plan, that the story that we have in our mind. I'm going to help you review that story. And I'm going to encourage you to think about possibly revising or improving if necessary. Maybe you don't need to improve your story at all. But that story, that second point, is one of the greatest filters. It, it is the number one thing that influences what you read, where you read in the Bible, and what you take from it when you do read. That's just how it works. And the third one is... Um, that we can improve our skills in reading ancient literature and in learning to meditate. The Bible is meditation literature, uh, for one thing, and um, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about these things, but the, the, here's, here's, these are three broad areas of stuff that I want to talk, that we want to go through and I'm not going to give you every answer, every part of it you ever wish to know, but I'm going to help you think about, about those things. When we talk about things like this, we sometimes, uh, let me, uh, we sometimes get nervous about things that sound as if they're going to mess with my core beliefs. And I understand that. I understand the, the, the reason for caution. And here I want to go back to the, the Grand Canyon for a bit. Uh, I, am, I am really... To finish that thought, I am really determined. Uh, I am really committed to teaching things that are uh, that are not heretical, that are not wrong, uh, that lead people toward what God's grand plan is. I'm committed to that. But sometimes, um, just saying things, just rehashing 
the same things we've always thought doesn't move us anywhere. And I ask you, if, if we just rehash what we are always thinking and we never talk about these kind of things here, we're going to keep getting the same kind of thing we're getting and our culture is going to keep on influencing us. Other ways of, of reading scripture and careless ways of reading scripture are going to become natural for us. Maybe they have already in some ways. Just become so natural that we think it's always been that way. And so being cautious is like can be like sitting on one of the picnic tables that's about a quarter mile back from the edge of the Grand Canyon and saying to our kids, the Grand Canyon is beautiful, it's huge, it's deep, but if you get close to the edge, it is terribly dangerous. It has, it drops off like the, the, the edge that I stood on, now I feel, I should have looked this up, but to, it, it sounds outrageous to say it, but I think that the river I was looking at at the bottom is like 5,000 feet below me. And, the, and some of that area has no guardrails. You can just walk out there one of, the, uh, one of the indigenous tribes that lives in the Grand Canyon is making big money. I haven't been to this place yet, but they made a glass platform 3,000 feet above the, above the bottom, and you can walk out on that thing 3,000 feet high, and they charge money for that, and people pay it, I suppose. Anyway, the Grand Canyon's amazing. So you, we can sit around the picnic table, and we can, we can say... What I can see from here is enough. And it's too risky to go to the edge. It's too risky to find the trail that goes down. Uh, we might run out of water down there. There's, Albert, there's Indians down there. <laughs> and <laughs> it, it could be, what? Yeah. Or we can learn how to, uh, we, can, we, can, we, we can cautiously and carefully learn skills that can help us enjoy and see uh, more of the Grand Canyon and understand it even better. Um, so I'd like to, uh, like to encourage us to, to, um, not be afraid of reviewing some of the things that we consider to be, or that we've just assumed to be true. I'd like you to uh, group up, just, just turn and talk to a few people right now um, with a question to ask. So just just three or four of you or five or six, get so you can talk to each other and give your group a, a, a rating. How much do you trust the Bible as we have it? This book, that the way we have it. On a scale of one to ten, one being, I don't, I have very little trust for it, and ten, I have 100% trust in that book the way we have it, and then give one reason why. One reason why. Okay, come on. Um, humor me and talk to each other. Or said for why you trust the Bible as much as you do. What are some of the reasons you trust it? Arthur, what'd you say? Well, I said one of the reasons I trust it is I know some people who translate like Henry and stuff and painting baking detail. They know one to do it and get it right. That makes me trust a lot. 
Okay? So Arthur, Arthur's trust increases because he knows that credible people have worked on it. Does that sit well with you? No, don't answer. <laughs> don't answer. That's good. Thank you. Someone else? Yes. Stephanie. I don't think that God would stray. He doesn't stray. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you you trust that God managed this thing. Yeah. Norman? Okay. All right. There's 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 been an incredible amount of of text material that supports it and has there's there's actual um, yeah there's an amazing amount of support for what what we have. Someone else? One more person? Yeah, Shelley. Okay, you back off a little bit because of the human factor. All right. Um, thank you. We're going to keep going here. Um, where does the Bible come from? We're going to talk about this a little bit more, but just, just a little bit of background so that you, and I covered a little bit of this already, First of all, uh, what is now the scripture, almost in every part of it, wasn't first written. Almost all of it was first passed on orally before it was ever written down. So that's a huge part. Even, even in New Testament times, even after the, the uh, Old Testament as we know it was completed and, and made a set of books, the next phase was also oral tradition for quite some time. It wasn't first written. So, um, and the writing, we don't know for sure, but the best guess is, is that the first archaic Hebrew writing was around 1400 BC. That's not that long ago. I mean, it sounds terribly long ago uh, in terms of how old a car, long a car lasts or something like that. But uh, really in, in, in history of things, if you think about it, that's not all that long. And uh, the, what, what became the New Testament was mostly finished written somewhere around 250 or a bit later. And, and again, people don't know for sure, but these are, these are pretty close estimates. But it still wasn't finished. It still wasn't like this for a long time yet. And there were a lot of councils that where uh, Christian leaders got together and debated rather strongly for long periods of time about some of the books. You might be amazed some of the books that they wondered and, and that some felt strongly should not be included and others felt they should. And there was then a fairly unanimous agreement, but not total, and people kept doing things. And even up to, do you know it was, it was as late as 1885, if my sources are correct, before the Apocrypha was not included in the King James Bible. 
That's pretty, did you know that, man? That's pretty amazing. The, so there was still, even, even as just a little more than 100 years ago, there was still debate about whether the Apocrypha should be included in, in this book. And today, some church traditions still include the Apocrypha. And so um, the idea that this book floated down at some point in history to some lucky church group or some very spiritual person and he passed it out or she passed it out or it, you know, it, it didn't happen that way. It took almost 2,000 years from beginning to the end, from 1400 to 250, that's not 2,000 quite, but it's not far from it in t- historical terms, for all this stuff to be collected. And it came from innumerable sources, not just one author per book. And it included quotes from other writings, from books that we don't even know what it was referring to, are quoted in the Bible. There are a lot of things that aren't, just aren't quite as clean as I thought as a child, as a youngster, that how this book came about. Now, this can either be unsettling because we just don't want to get that close to the Grand Canyon and it's better to just keep saying no it came as a package there's no question about what ought to be in there there's there's no no debate about it we can keep saying that but our children and skeptics may find out that some of the things we say aren't 100 percent factual and then how are we going to handle that you know we can we can keep we can, we can make extreme statements so that we're not questioning things, but if those extreme statements are actually not true, then we're not really helping ourselves in the long run. So uh, that's, that's my concern in all of this, is let's, let's be as factual as we can, but still come at it from a perspective of faith and a perspective of confidence in a God who reveals himself, who discloses who he is, that's what really matters. Oh, I should have had this up while I was talking about that. That's part of what I was going to illustrate there, another shot of the Grand Canyon. (laughs) I found this really good quote, but... Somehow, I can't remember where I got it. So it's not mine, but I don't know who to attribute it to. I think I know, but I'm not going to say because I don't know for sure. One person said, I have found the scriptures to be a bottomless source of wisdom, beauty, inspiration, and challenge. Many people in our culture view the Bible as an ancient, irrelevant, even oppressive book. But the problem lies mainly with us. We've simply lost the ability to read a piece of literature as sophisticated and profound as the Bible, not to mention one that comes from an ancient culture and was written in other languages. So that brings me to the list, a list at least, of difficulties we face. In in my view, my understanding, it's not that only educated, learned people should read the Bible or explain it. That's an extreme. But to pretend that it's simple literature and anybody should just be able to take it without any discipleship, without any training, and read it, I'll illustrate a little bit later how, 
how unrealistic that is. Here's some of the difficulties. It's ancient literature. We forget that a lot of times, or we have the approach to reading the Bible that it's so supernatural that that doesn't matter. That it is that God, even though things were originally written in ancient words and language, what we have now, the Holy Spirit just translates that into our time and place and language and culture, and the very same words and thoughts just apply. Let me, probably both are true, aren't they? Let me, let me say right away that it's not just one or the other. Well, let me illustrate something. We all know wise King Solomon. What language did he speak? Some kind of Hebrew. I uh, don't know for sure whether it would still have been ancient Hebrew or the more modern, not today's Hebrew, but a little more modern. There were several changes along the way. But, okay, so now Solomon, in all his great wisdom and the opportunities he had, he learned to read English. And here's a paragraph he stumbled onto that actually was sort of backdated for him, or it, however, like a bit of a time machine thing happened, and he is now, he knows how to read English, and he comes across this paragraph. Two wireless bridges may be used to connect two wired networks over a wireless link, useful in situations where a wired connection may be unavailable, such as between two separate homes or for devices which do not have wireless networking capability, but have wired networking capability. Solomon is a smart man, and he knows that this has to have tremendous meaning but just imagine what he does with this. Now, that's not exactly what happens when we read some of the Psalms or some of the oracles in Isaiah, but it's close. It's close. And if I really jerk your rug a little bit, We'll get maybe just to, just to stir your pot. It's close to what happens when we read Genesis 1. It's pretty close to the same thing. And uh, now, now you're going to walk out. And, but I, I think that'll make you come back. I think, oh, Jeff's, Jeff's leaving already. It is time for a break, and maybe that's a maybe that's a good place. Go go to the washroom or do whatever you want. Just five minutes, okay? And we're gonna we've got lots to cover yet tonight.